Hello, Hello everyone. everyone. Thanks, Thanks so, so much, much for, for coming. coming. Um, I know there's, there's a lot, a lot of, of events this weekend. Uh, we really appreciate uh, uh, you choose our CKK events. I think you're, you're the lucky, lucky ones. ones. <laughs> <laughs> so we have really have amazing, amazing performance by Fuyuki last night. Um, um, it's really mind blowing. And today, today uh, we we'll start with a series of seminars. Um, and then we, we have, have a long, long night uh, animation screening, which, which you can see over there. We've set up a little station uh, uh, with a DJ list, which is going to have a marathon, marathon animation screening um, st after, after the, the seminars, seminars tonight. tonight. Um, so, so to begin with, um, Hidomi approached um, us a couple months ago that uh, it was the first time that she introduced this term, Sekaike, to us. It was a very new term. Um, and fascinating idea how she um, tried to define it and how she thinks that this could be an argument to link with visual arts because most of you know that at Parasite we do more uh, contemporary art exhibitions. And starting with that, we found this is very interesting because it's such a term, not just uh, 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 very new to in its own terrain, but also I think it quite first time in Hong Kong, we have a substantial defense to introduce this uh, uh, terminology. So that's how to begin with this alone night, we can uh, all dedicate it to what you can interpret it, uh, say Kai can, in various different forms. And so start with uh, today, uh, the seminars we invite, we uh, say Hidomi, we also have Sonia Wong uh, with us and Dr. Uh, Akiko and Christopher Howard with us. So we will have a, a quite interesting uh, conversation and discussion. Uh, they all have a different uh, input and perspectives of how Sekai can in this uh, subculture genre, Japanese subculture genre, can elaborate uh, to the social dynamics, uh, not just in Japan, but also in the region. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'll pass the mic to Hidomi. Hello everyone. Thank you very much for coming today for such a weather. And then also, I know that there are so many other events today, um, if you're aware of it. And um, so today, um, uh, thank you very much for introduction, Flea. So we've been working for a few months for you know, back and forth. And um, I believe today you are expecting to listen about Sekaike, anime, comic, game world. Yes, and then uh, it started last night uh, from Fuyuki Yamaka's uh, premiere performance in Hong Kong, and then was, was yeah, so some, some of you have been here. Um, so um, today we have a series of presentations, and then in, the, in this, uh, my talk, I will explain a little bit uh, access uh, address to the other speakers as well. Um, the first, uh, the title, there is no such things as society, Sekai like Imagination and Visual Art. Um, this uh, word is by Margaret Thatcher. Uh, you might know it's, a, it's a, um, from UK. And um, of course, he, she talked about this, uh, 1987, and then this is not the, this is what's said in different context, of course. But I believe this sentence pinned down the essence of Sekai Game. So, um, and then this title, uh, this title in Japanese is used for the anthology book of Sekai Game. Um, so, yeah, as I told, my presentation is not about anime because I'm the person from hardcore contemporary art. Um, though I myself used to be a big fan of shoujo manga, uh, I mean girls manga, uh, when I was very young, and then of also boys love stuff, I liked it. And um, I myself was drawing manga by myself, and then me and my friend published zines uh, when I was very young, anyway. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I am not the generation that uh, watch so-called these sekaike animations. Uh, but besides, uh, later Dr. Won and then Dr. Sugawa, Akiko Sugawa, will talk about it. Uh, Sekaike context is very, very, very uh, male-dominant world. Uh, so maybe that's another reason that I didn't really watch this kind of animation. And uh, Sekaike, what, so what is Sekaike? Sekaike is a narrative discourse of Japanese subcultural field 
And then, yeah, as also uh, Flea mentioned, why we would like to do this project in Parasite? Well, I would venture to interpret Sekaike as an expanded notion that could be adopted to contemporary art. So I think Sekaike is already very pervasive in Japan for the other, so many other cultural productions by Hiroki Azuma, Tamaki Saito, or Kiyoshi Kasai and others. According to Hiroki Azuma, a cultural critic, novelist, and a philosopher, um, some, of may, some of you may know already, um, because he's very famous in ACCO, uh, Sekaike is a narrative discourse that's very narrow human relationship, such as you and me, or you, yourself, me, myself, directly links to the world peace or human survival. The description of realistic societies or society at large has been ignored by the only the small world centered by the protagonist and his or her partner or immediate acquaintance. So let's, let's imagine, um, often at the school, somehow the boy or girl has been chosen for a savior of the world. The person needs to fight for protecting the world against the aliens. Usually, good science fiction stories describe how the international organizations react on the situation, or the general public and mass media in different countries would panic, and should be so many things affect their school life. But in Sekaike story, there's very normal campus life goes on, like, uh, like protagonist complain about teacher and then doing homework and then having dates, but still he or she time to time needs to go to outer space to fight the world, fight for the world. So in short, you and me directly link to the massive crisis of the world, not much explanation of why and how the society reacts and why they were chosen. So between you and the world crisis, I mean big narrative, and then almost nothing in the middle. Um, so let me show you a small uh, clip. So this is a TV commercial of Nissin Cup Noodle. Uh, maybe not in here, but in Japan. But this is actually relatively shows what the Sekaike is. What the boy and girl talked about it is about their relationship. Boy asked, um, boy, are we boyfriend and girlfriend? And she said, what? And because you have never told me you love me. And then she said, oh, OK, I love you. And then she asked, what? You have to tell me really decently? And then she said, okay, I decently love you. So that's the, what they're talking about. They don't care about what's going on in, you know, around them. So this is the one example. So um, historically, the term came up with an Internet Anonymous in 2002. I mean, I'm talking about Sekaike, by a figure known as the handle name Plunier. And... Um, Oops. Neon Genesis Evangelion is considered to be an archetypal Sekaike anime. And then in the 2000s, Neologism Ever Rescue was synonyms with Sekaike. And this term, a modification of Evangelion, was reportedly coined in 2002 as well. So as Yohei Kurose will discuss later today, there are so many other animes and films of Sekaike works. Most discussed ones are uh, Sai Shuheiki Kanojo, Saikano, She, The Ultimate Weapon, 2000 to 2001 by Shin Takahashi, and this, uh, Voice of Distant Star, Hoshi no Koe, 2002 by Makoto Shinkai. And, uh, oops, uh, sorry. 
So this is a, the Sky of Media Summer of U4, 2002-2009, because it's a kind of media mix by um, Akito Mizu, sorry, Mizuhito Akiyama. Once in 2010s, some said Sekaike has ended. And then later uh, by Dr. Howard, we'll talk about, talk about uh, post-Sekaike animes like Death Note and others. And then, but actually it is even developed in the philosophical world that more than 10 books specifically discuss about Sekaike were published in 2010s. And on the blockbuster, Your Name, by Makoto Shinkai, it's last year, 2017, is also considered as a sekaike. So there are several sub-genres within sekaike, that's time loop type, that you will see Urusei Yatsura today, later, uh, tonight's screening, and some features like many monologues by the male protagonist who has a quite low self-esteem, and then female characters normally have a superpower and mother-like character or tsundere character, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So among description um, of definition of sekaike, I think all the thinkers mentioned that uh, sekaike is ignoring the social sphere. Sekaike refers to works that focus on single characters or, or just two, two people and which bypass social, political, national, and cultural discourse to touch directly to massive stories like world peace and grand narratives. So this kind of stories gain the world popularity, as you may know, how the Japanese subcultural products are pervasive everywhere, not only within Asia, but in Europe and the States. So okay, uh, now I tell you how I came about the idea of this project. Uh, in September 2016, I went to the inaugural exhibition at the Pavilion uh, of M+. It's, uh, it's going to be a, a gigantic uh, museum in 2020. There was an exhibition by Hong Kong artist Zhang Yuan. If you are interested, the text, uh, text is on this, uh, um, this link uh, by Asia Pacific. And um, so now uh, let's see this exhibition. So there's an upper flight of stairs. The viewers would pass through a mirrored corridor with the floor covered with text, evoking Nietzsche's uh, eternal recollence that cited previously in 2015 Venice Pavilion. And um, inside entrance, uh, so just it's a huge uh, install, uh, huge video of Stanley Kubrick's moving image of prison facing image, and on the um, on the opposite side of the wall was a wide moving image of trees from Belatar. A shrine-like black box sat alone in uh, the left corner, while six columns covered with aluminum are placed randomly between cubic and tall. So crossing, four columns were elected, like you see. It's a little bit uh, bright, but you can see four columns and they're together with six. Uh, Ill-fated number four is associated with the death in Chinese culture and also Japanese culture as well. And in the representation of Aoki Gahara Jukai, a forest in Japan, according to the artist, which is also known as the forest of suicide. And crossing right outer sphere as an Aslim's image, passed onto the scene, smooth sectionalization and barriers came up next to the guidance to the inner space and to impede physical movement. These setups altogether afforded an intimate experience, both body and visual. And stepping into the shrine-like box, situated in the inner space, uh, viewers would be bombarded with the subtle Beethoven's Moonlight Serenade, Kurt Cobain's image, uh, Kurt Cobain Nirvana's uh, uh, projected on the wall, and Tan's signature animated text, text of philosophy. So the title of this whole exhibition, a whole installation, is Nothing with Strikes Through. Uh, so many fragments of the artist's private interest 
like、uh, he loves classic music and some films in there and rock band Nirvana has been his idol for so many years. Directly links life and death, eternality, Taoism and Nietzsche. So suddenly I got an idea that the isn't it a sekai k? So I was not sure if I could sell lies in good way, but the narrative discourse indicates this is a sekai k. And in most of Tan's video installations, the repeating text that appears on the walls and、uh, walls and ceilings and floors, and then derived from、um, Nietzsche and Bible and those kind of grand narrative topics, including life and death and good and evil, ethics and universe, are unifying themes in his works. From the way Tan composed a private interpretation of philosophy. And religion regarding the listed topics, the animated text video installations, which is Tan's signature piece, such as the Seven Seals series, animated text cover all over the walls. And needless to say, the works refer to the Book of Revelation,、uh, part of the Bible. And then coincidentally, Hiroki Azuma mentioned that the Book of Revelation could be interpreted as sekai ge narrative. So, as without any social aspect, these Tan's works have one characteristic of sekai ke. So, even compared to pre previous works, nothing with strikes through utilizes numerous private images, videos, and music, and represent Tan's inner world and linking topics like meta narratives, that、uh, Buddhist poetry and eternal recurrence and Shakespeare, without any real social aspect. So the piece of art is extremely private linkage of my own memory fragments to religious or philosophical or meta narratives. Such practice even more sekaike. So then I thought about another example.、Uh, one of my favorite artists,、uh, Ho Chun Yen.、Um, his early works, early video works, Off of 2009 and Cloud of Unknowing 2013. So this is the film still from Earth. So those works made him well known in this in this、uh, moving image field, and those also directly linked to apocalypse Christian topics of Western master paintings. That's about grand narratives of Christianity, and Earth visually constructed based on the Western master religious paintings. And this is a Jericho's、uh, things and. And then this is a drawings that he collaged from all the Western paintings for us, and this is a film still from us. And this is a Caravaggio's painting of Jesus Christ healing disease, and this is also the film still. So it all relates to the. Sort of Christian, Christian master paintings, and then all the grand narratives. And this is a mystical book、uh, titled "The Cloud of Unknowing" from the Bible. So Ho Chun Yen took one from his title. So this has been shown in、uh, Singapore Pavilion in Venice, 2011. So this one also took so many images of clouds from the、um, master paintings. This is a Tintoretto Paradise, and this is a Collegio, and this is a, a Collegio's Jupiter and Io,、uh, 1530. Io was、um, together with,、uh, and this is a film still of from the Crowd of Unknowing. So,、um, so both of these films, whole films, throw a viewer. Into an apocalyptic situation, lacking any guiding explanation or narrative, it's as if the artist is only interested in documenting the situation down to the slightest details. The underlying reasons, players, and timeline leading up to it are completely omitted. This point, most likely the artist's intention, though, could be sekaike. In sekaike as well, specific questions about why the destroyer came to attack the Earth. 
or why the protagonist was chosen to fight it are often ignored. And this is because the crux of narrative lies not in addressing the reasons for us peril, but instead portraying how the situation reflects the protagonist's inner life, also while explaining the reasons to viewers would increase the narrative's credibility, but the artist might doubt the necessity of such credibility seeing as viewers understand that is an invented story. I mean, it's an invented story to begin with, so why do we have to explain? So something like this. So um, today, both Sankiwa and Hotsunian seems Christianity and Western philosophy, but grand narratives are not only Christianity. Like Fuyuki Yamaka's performance last night, directly connects to the ancient way of singing Homei and primitivism and animism on some, or some, so to say, maybe he, he, he denied, but could be a spiritual world. So as he sang Homei, and he could stop his heartbeat, I mean, not really stop, but slow his heartbeat, and shows audience by the light, the art connects directly life and death, directly link to person, to something, something like nature, some superpower or, superpower or universe, or et cetera, et cetera, could be seen as the guy game. So that's why I asked him to do the performance last night. So let me elaborate. Uh, Sekaike is some narratives omitting social issues that's likely happen in the real and complex world. Socially engaged art is opposite kind of artist practice in addition. And the world crisis can be grand narratives. This has been once believed in modern time, according to Jean-Francois Riotal, in the postmodern condition. Grand narratives are uh, the emancipation narrative of Christianity that love liberates human being from all its nothing. The enlightenment narrative in which the hero of knowledge works towards a good ethical, political, and universal peace. The Marxist narrative which emancipate and revelate proletariat art from, uh, from alienation and exploitation. The capitalism narrative that's the economical and industrial development free people from poverty. So, if I extract the essence of the notion that the old thinkers agree about Sekaike, is that the um, can be interpreted like Sekaike art directly connects private issues, images, objects, popular culture, cultural productions to the grand narratives. So the narrative can be ended both utopian or dystopian or anyways. As Levi Strauss wrote, a narrative which, like all narrative, must generate the illusion of an imaginary resolution of real contradictions. So in postmodern times, the grand narratives are dead, as many postmodern scholars said. But now, there are myriads of narratives, yes. However, yet, we always have a desire to see a big picture as micro history, as micro things. Grand narratives that we can believe in. Look at the popular Hollywood movies. So many Hollywood movies or so many popular um, animes. Most of the entertainment stories, we can see some myth or grand narratives in many, in so many forms. So Sekaike narratives could fill the gap of reality and people's desire. So. I initially thought about the exhibition project, and there could be so many other examples. So I can, I can just introduce you briefly, even though uh, some of you have never seen these works, but um, actually these are very, very famous works. I'm gonna introduce you, so um, just, just be patient. Um, so this is uh, Andre Salano, the artist, American artist called Immersion. Peace Christ. This is a 1987 by photo piece with the, the it, this is a photo of uh, really golden, uh, this, this looks really red, but uh, it's yellowy, uh, beautiful water, and then there's a cross and uh, Christ. But this has made a big, big con controversial, of course, uh, among the um, general public. Um, but this could be the Sekaike narrative because of his own, I mean, artist's own piece and 
um, and Bryce is here. And this is a 500 lakans by Takashi Murakami. I mean, 500 arhats, sorry. Uh, lakan is Japanese way. Um, this is a 100 meter long painting, 100 meters. And then uh, this is uh, made by all together with 200 students. And then this is a contemporary, contemporary interpretation of 500 monks and Japanese Buddhism, also relates to Fukushima disaster. So Murakami has been explored the Dalma or other Buddh uh, Buddhism team theme since 2007 or earlier. So next one was also another very famous Namjoon Pike. Uh, first, it, this is among the first video installation in 1963. Uh, title is Zen for TV. Um, so this is um, another version of Stature of Buddha because the original one is only the monitor with the line. So, um, so Buddha is watching TV and meditating with his face. So it uh, includes a lot of uh, sense of humor, and then, but refers to Buddhism and East Asian philosophy of life, and the television becomes an object of quiet, of emerge, immersion, humorously being watched by Buddha. So the another piece, uh, another work, uh, this is uh, um, kind of uh, latest work, Kan Shuan, young artist, Chinese, or everything. This is a uh, stages of Buddhas from she from the found object, and then just the monitors. Ten, this this one is ten figures of Buddha, and then subjected uh, plastically of televisual embodiment. Their classical forms twisted and disguised by the playful gaze of the camera. And then probably this one, Barnett Newman by Herricus Sublimes, 1950 to 1951. Uh, he's uh, one of the biggest, I mean, his biggest painting. And then he's a very famous minimalist uh, color field painter. The artist instructed to see this large painting with a very short distance. Because uh, artist thinks that, I mean, he wrote the instruction, that then you can feel the universe of the spirit. So Newman believed deeply in the spiritual potential of abstract art, and he himself is really um, strict uh, Judaist. And then the Latin title of this painting means man, heroic, and sublime. So um, other, his other works also refer so many of Judaists, like uh, synagogues and so on. And next one is Yayoi Kusama, one of the most popular contemporary Asian artists. As you may know, she has been mentally ill for so many years since she was very young. Her way of producing the paintings are at the same time works like her art therapy. So those infinity paintings since 1960s, but now, sorry, this is installation, not paintings, but she has so many other works called infinity nets, infinity dots. So she was obsessed nets and dots and male um, penis kind of shape. So her own individual obsession to those, those things, those minimalistic things. It's notion of infinity and universe and so on, so directly links. So maybe this, many of her works is quite psychic. So next one is from last year, Pierre Luig, After a Life Ahead, 2017. This is a former ice link, and it's really huge. And then really massive, piece for the Munster, the sculpture project last year. Um, Munster uh, sculpture project is once in 10 years. I mean, seven years, 10 years? Oh, I mixed it up. Anyway, um, so it's, it's once in so long time. And then, um, anyway, here you placed bees and peacocks, of course, they are alive, and the algae inside excavated hunger-like structure, transforming it into a living organism and animating it via an augmented reality applications. So unseen sensors monitor the movement of the peacocks and bees, as well as the CO2 level and the bacteria within ice link, and algorithm, algorithm uses this data to calculate the average vitality of the space and cables buried beneath the ground, and it connects to transmit this information to um, incubator containing the human cancer cells. 
So when the space has higher vitality, so does the petri dish with cancer uh, cells uh, is worse part. Our, I mean, they, they, they just uh, increase. So Huey uh, created unpredictable, but made by an artist, but it beyond human's control as an individual's imagination. So the beast throw visitors in a very unique uh, environment. It's man-made, but un uncontrollable system. So without an explanation like Sekaike, and let visitors just throw into this place and they'll feel some enormous power of life, or, or maybe they don't, but um, that's supposed to be. So um, I have more examples, but the last one is another famous piece you might know. This is a Maurizio Catalan, La Nona Ola. So La Nona Ola means seventh hours, means that's time of the uh, Christ death. So this is a Roman Pope, uh, what's the name? Yes, uh, Pope John Paul II, the, the, I think the one before, right? So he's felt by a metal. So that usually metal was thought to be the divinely done by God. So the work takes its title from, yeah, the Jesus Christ death. So in a press article, of course there are so many controversial as well. I mean, so many Christians get really pissed off with this piece. But in a press article, Catalan explained in the meaning, I had immense respect for Pope John Paul II. Even old and tired, afflicted with Parkinson's disease, he still kept touring the world and the meteorite sent by God stops his overzealous servant from accepting any burden. So isn't it funny that he explained to you know, soften all those controversials? Anyway, um, but so there were some who believed that works were provocation and sign of contempt. Yes, it is, but they were a way of base. It was actually an act of mercy. That's what he said. So well, um, he made this excuse. But this can be just another funny work of Catalan made, but it could be read within, uh, it could be read within Sekai Ke context as well. So um, in a contemporary art field, the socially engaged art is quite dominant these days. Since Sekai Ke narrative omits all the social aspects, trying to uh, get rid of all the social aspects or, or non-fictitious elements, it automatically indicates the opposite of social engaged art. This opposition requires more detailed and by detailed evidence and observations, of course. However, it is easy to believe social engaged art and sekaike art. It, if we could call it, uh, these are two arts that have opposite style, op over cover mutually exclusive areas. Even sometimes, what they intend is the same. So on the other hand, the Sekake narrative allows creative imagination of artists freely that it has a potential to deepen the understanding of human beings and the world as a whole, and helps to draw a macro-historical picture since it states humans' reaction, humans' inner emotion towards extreme situation fictively without any in-between noises from the society. So for example, the social engaged art that's stating the micro narratives based on real stories in specific contexts is incapable of doing so that Sekaike might realize. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hidomi. I think it we might have a lot of questions. I personally have a lot of questions already, but we wait for during the panel discussion. And now that's we'll count our next speaker, Sonia Wong. Sonia is a writer and um, artist currently based in Hong Kong. Uh, she is the founder of A Real Woman Hong Kong, and she recently uh, founded the first woman festival in Hong Kong uh, at an Eaton Hotel. Like tonight. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Sonia. Thanks, Rhea. 
and thanks Hitomi for the great presentation. Mine is like way less, um, I, I have a lot of slides, like don't worry, um, but they are like pictures and I'm way less informative, I guess. Um, so, um, okay, so the topic uh, of today is like uh, girls at the end of the world, um, because before, like this will be like really relaxing, like not informative at all. Um, so before um, accepting or before being invited uh, to take part in this talk by Catherine and um, and Freya was so kind to take me in and he told me like nodded and said that okay she can come. Um, so before like uh, accepting the invitation and joining this um, panel discussion, um, I actually know nothing about Sakai Care, but of course I kind of like accidentally. Um, end up like having watched some of the work that is uh, regarded as like the Kaike classics. Um, and so yeah, but anyway, so this will, um, this will be less about like the Kaike itself or the concept of the Kaike, but more about like some thoughts I have after um, knowing, like understanding the notion of the Kaike and how it relates to um, the things that I am originally pretty interested in. So disclaimer first, I'm not an anime expert and I'm not a Kaike expert. So. I mean, like bottom line up front, um, less expectation. So from what I know, um, from like being with Freya and being with Catherine and watching um, the stuff that I've watched, I kind of like have some very brief like personal understanding of what Sekaike is and uh, which leads me to like my later point. So um, as Hitomi have said, um, in this tradition of Sekaike or in the genre of Sekaike, like basically the whole narrative circles around, like focus on like the young male protagonist. Um, so that is like one very big thing for me because I am all about like female protagonists, female empowerment, female subjectivity. So it's really problematic for me. So I was like, okay, am I the right person to be talking about Sekaike? It really bugs me, right? Um, I, I'm sure it should bugs like all of you, but yeah. Okay, so um, the second thing that I know about Sekaike is probably some like old Sekaike story happens um, there would be, uh, I don't know, like an apocalyptic moment, there would be like world destruction, like human survival if it's, as r it's at risk, or there are like some really dramatic change, like in like the world that the um, characters inhabits. And so like the first thing is like a focus on men. Um, the second is like the world was in turmoil, like the world is going into turmoil or at least. And the third thing is it emerges out of a context, like so more about the context, not about the content. So that like from what I know, Sekaike kind of emerges from like the 80s and 90s where like there were like economic bubble and like, like the whole social structure, the established social structure in Japan especially was kind of crumbling. And for young people, it means that um, it means that basically the whole foundation of society and existing social structure kind of was shaken. And that for them, like they suffer the most because they are like for all the time they have been brought up, of course, um, like people of all ages from all walks of life would be affected. But then for young people especially, um, they can't see a future because like the society that, or the social structure that they rely on is so fundamentally changed. Or let's just say um, they, like, they no longer have permanent jobs. Like upward mobility was greatly restricted. Or that they can't see any hope in the future. And for this, they are really confused about, they're confused about their position in the world. Because like, if you rely so much on social structure to define your own existence, if you rely so much on what the society tells you to be and what you ought to be to understand your purpose and your meaning in life, then probably like you would be really confused. It affects your like personal understanding and self-identity. And it's really problematic and really devastating. And that dis disillusionment basically pushes them, um, or especially for young men, they kind of seek refuge in work that I don't know. Like for me, uh, from my understanding, like. I don't know, a lot of high fantasy and like probably in the work of Sekaike, like saving the world seems like a really good way of like channeling your energy because now that you do not have anything else to look forward to or like there's like very little thing that would give you a sense of purpose because you can't get a decent job, you can't support your family, you can't get a wife, you can't start a family or things like that. And there's basically no place in the, like no place in the real society for you to kind of relate yourself or identify yourself to. And so like the work of like the Sekaike work in ACG basically offered them a new way of connecting with the world and finding their purpose and position in the world. And so like once again, 
um, because like a lot of the times, I guess especially because like women were occupying like a rather marginal position in Japanese society, or that they are less devoted ACG consumer and creator. Um, they like very often the work centers on this kind of male frustration and that like women like being sexual object and like being objectified in society for as long as there is society. Um, like in works of Sakaike, like they still occupy like some sometimes. Like correct me if I'm wrong. I probably am wrong. Um, like probably Dr. Howard will correct me like very soon. Um, and so they usually end up being like objects of fantasy, even though of course later on we'll see in a lot of work they still they were still protagonists. But then like their subject position is rather like for me is rather problematic. And so like so that is like I told you everything I know about Sakaike, and which leads me to my other points. So my discussion comes from so when I was thinking about like let's just say like huge social change, um, the breakdown of like existing social order. And I thought about the umbrella movement. Because like for me, it kind of when I think about like the 80s and 90s, even though Hong Kong had its share of economic crisis, both in like late 90s and early 2000 and early 2010 and like, like just every 10 years, let's just say. Um, but then like the social structure or like how we imagine or how we relate to society, it kind of, um, yeah, so it was, of course, like in the late 80s and 90s, where Hong Kong was, um, when Britain and China was negotiating Hong Kong's handover, there was that kind of loss of hope and um, basically everything that we think we know about society and everything we have hoped for kind of was vanished. But then I was too young to understand that. But for me, like the real big change and the kind of, like the kind of um, utopic or reimagination the kind of effort of reimagining society, as he told me, was uh, just talking about, kind of emerges like in late 2010 to like pretty recently. And I think one of the key moments um, would be um, the umbrella movement. Um, so uh, if you're not from Hong Kong, then, um, then you should Google it. But anyway, um, so the umbrella movement um, happened in 2014. And um, so it was like a very key moment because I, was, I, was, I started teaching in university like around that time and I was with my students. And so I kind of get the feeling. So me and my friends were all joining the movement. Um, basically all of my students went. And there was a very strong sense of how like it's the same, it's the same, it's the same situation or, or the very similar sentiment as um, what I've explained. Like, like people lo losing hope in society and not knowing how they could, not knowing their position, not knowing their purpose, and not knowing the future. And so, a very brief note about like the Umbrella Revolution. Some people call it the Umbrella Movement. It occurred. Um, it took place in Hong Kong from September to December in 2014, which is like four years ago. Um, so it was, um, this movement started because of uh, political um, discontent and it was like a long accumulated thing. And of course it's something that has to, is very social, is very political and is very institutional. But this, um, basically this how, to see how corrupted or how failed or how the system fails you, um, kind of push people um, onto the street um, to basically act out what they think um, society could be. And it started with student strike, uh, which is also a very important point I want to highlight because like young people were involved like heavily, um, basically they were the foundation of the movement. So it started with the student strike. Um, of course I was there. Um, I was like one of the umbrella. It's very interesting to look at the image, like how, how, um, how the umbrella was like showing a very early on in the movement, but it was because it was a very, very hot day. It was super sunny in CUHK and so, but anyway, yeah, so that was, uh, that was me noticing the umbrella. And it's very interesting how actually the, um, the notion of occupying central was proposed earlier by a bunch of quote unquote adults and politicians, but later on it, it was really because of students and young people's involvement that it really took off and um, ends up being a very large scale movement. And yeah, so that was the day. Um, it felt like the end of the world. I think I was somewhere 
like, well, 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 somewhere there. It was uh, September 28th, um, like not very far away from here. Um, and, but it didn't start there. So I'm not sure if I'm going to explain the whole thing. But then, so young people's involvement, it was for a very long time that young people in Hong Kong was not very politically active. Of course, they were very politically active during the 70s and later on in late 80s, when not, but not so much in late 80s, I think, like mostly in 60s and 70s. And there was a very long period of time where Hong Kong young people, because Hong Kong was so rich, they kind of focus on improving their life, like struggling to move upward, uh, move up the social ladder, and kind of stay away from like politics or direct involvement with society. And I mean, Hong Kong is like before the umbrella movement and everything, Hong Kong young people especially is known for being rather apolitical and they do not, they simply do not care. Because if you can like earn money easily, if you graduate from university, you can easily get a flat, you can get a wife, you can buy a car, you can have children that live a very good life, then probably there are only, you will only care so much. But then like rewinding to 2012, it was like the, it was, I think it was like the first time where people um, who are so young, um, beginning like begin like caring and beginning to like step up and say that this is not okay. And this relationship was very, very direct, but because before every, before anyone noticed anything was wrong, um, like a group of high school, like secondary school students who was like, I don't know, 14 or 15, they just um, organized, like uh, they started an uh, organization against uh, moral and national education. And it was like one of the, I think it was the first movement like in Hong Kong that was um, led by like people who were so young. And you can see that they are really, really, really young and they like present themselves that way. They are not pretending to be like older than they are and they fight in a very innocent way. And yeah, of course I was there. Um, and then like slightly, slightly earlier on in 2009 and 2010, there was the anti-Hong Kong Express rail link movement, which like the, um, the high-speed railway station, I think, opened today. Um, so it was another time where like, I don't know, 20 or 10 years after um, the last time when Hong Kong young people were so prominent in social movement and fighting against some social injustice, um, that it really, that the notion of young people like was so was so under the spotlight because like in this banner if you do not read chinese they were saying that post 80s be uh, post 80s or like how do you say i don't know so they were carrying out some sort of protests and so they are all young people and they are fighting in a, if not very artistic way they are fighting in a, like a non-violent way which was which was very different from like what people usually associate with protests, even though protests in Hong Kong are relatively uh, calm and peaceful, but they are doing it in a way that is very, I don't know, meditative. And this is really new. And okay, so fast forward going back to 2014, um, we have to understand how like the umbrella movement didn't start because there was an umbrella movement or like people suddenly decide to go onto the street. Um, I was there at the anti-North East New Territory Development Project protest, which is also the same protest that sent a lot of young Hong Kong um, activists into jail. And so this, it went on for at least several weeks and um, it was really, really scary. I, I, was, I, was, I was there in that black and white photo, like somewhere in the middle. Uh, we were trapped by the police for several hours and it felt so concrete the connection between you and the establishment or the you and the, between you and the fate of, of, I won't say society. And I remember it was the first time like uh, during the anti-nationalist education movement where I feel like there is such strong connection between you and what happens to, I don't know, connection between you and the future of society and you between institution. And and at that moment, you were thinking, if they take any, um, if they decide to, to, let's just say, suppress the protest, you would just die. And of course, if, if your death means anything, probably they will withdraw the uh, national education scheme. Um, but yeah, so it started as the um, student movement. There were a lot of young people there. 
and later on it evolved into a full-blown movement. And, but after 79 days, nothing happened or nothing changed. Like according to some people, nothing changed. So our psychic kind of like project of like saving the world, like protecting society kind of like just failed. Um, I, I, I'm very sure because I was, I was there and I kind of felt like it, it, it seems like we were able to do something. There it seems like we were able to change something. And, um, and so it was a movement that was driven by desperation or disappointment and it ends in desperation. Like it, it just end, ends in despair for many people. Of course it was, I was I, I'm still very hopeful, but a lot of people ask like, what now? What's next? Like if, let's just say if, I don't know if in the voice of, like the voice of the star or whatever, like if she fails to save the planet, like what happens? Like of course it ends up like being like she was just like flying very far off into the universe and not being able to come back. So what if there is no satisfactory answer? And um, yeah, so what's next? Like what if our project of saving the world and human survival just like, I don't know, failed? Um, but yeah, so that was one thing. Okay, so that was like one thing that I was thinking about like in relation to Sekai Ke. But the second thing that kind of like was the thing that struck me the most, apart from the, um, apart from the sense of um, despair and um, disappointment and like the strong connection uh, with the fate of society or, or if not like the world. The second thing is um, that really struck me is when, let's just say like Kitomi and I was like chatting about like um, what the umbrella movement means to like both of us um, and what we see in the umbrella movement was a kind of suspension of established social order. And it seems that it was like, at least in, in, in the occupation side, there was a reimagination of what the world can be and they were trying to act it out. So it was like our own social experiment or project that we're trying to bring, I won't say heaven to earth, but then we were trying to create something new. And in such a turbulent time, it seems that a lot of like social order was um, suspended, a lot of like bad habits that we have, kind of, we kind of got rid of them. We were nicer to each other. Uh, we tried to clean up after ourselves. We tried to share things, there were communal living. There were a new way of us connecting with other people, if not to the land and probably to the janitors and to like the road and to our city. And, but then something did not change, like for me. Um, so I was thinking in such a time, does it mean that let's just say if I am a pilot who is driving a robot, like fighting monsters in a distant galaxy, does it mean that I stop being a girl? Like when I am in the occupation site, when I was facing all the things that are out of the normal, like uh, when I was facing the police or when I am like walking in the occupation site, sleeping in tents, does, does it mean that I stop being a girl? Like can I exist as, a, as merely a human being instead of being a gendered like thing? And no, the answer is no. Um, so I was like, so, okay, going back a bit, like this is a bit like jumpy, I, anyway, sorry. Um, so like going back to the student involvement. So um, one thing, of course, when we, when you look at uh, re news report or a lot of writings, a lot of photos um, of the occupation site, you will see that like young people, of course, because they were, um, they made up a large part of, um, large part of uh, the protester or did they? Probably, there are a lot of other people, so let's just say middle-aged person or old people, but then young people were, f were, were featured like most prominently, and there are reasons to that. Like probably because they represent innocence, probably because they represent hope, because they represent, I don't know, the lack of calculation or political affiliation or a lot of stuff. And among the students, it's a very interesting very interesting divide, which I will try to show you and explain later. When I searched like umbrella movement student, the first thing that I found are like uh, photos of schoolgirls. Um, I think they're from the same, same school as I, I was. Um, 
So there are a lot of photos of schoolgirls. So why are schoolgirls featured more prominently than, I don't know, like male students? Like, think about it, right? Um, so how the image of a girl, um, I won't say they are utilized as a symbol, but then um, there is definitely, I won't say an unhealthy dose of interest, but they are definitely featured more prominently than like, I don't know, young boys who were in the, um, but young boys were featured in a very different way and a different light and a different role. But when we talk about the movement or when we talk about the city, a lot of the time we talk, it, uh, we, we, we talk about the city using the female pronoun, like that she needs protection that the future generation needs protection, that they need saving. Is it the same reason why like image of young girls are featured prominently in the protests? Probably, right? How we are conceptualizing the world and how we are conceptualizing our mission to save the world or like human survival. Are we thinking it along the same line as, I don't know, a knight trying to save a damsel in distress? Probably. Is it a demonstration of Masculinity? I don't know, but like just some, some thoughts that I have. And so when I was thinking the connection, like between I'm like, trying to organize my thoughts and think about the connection between the two, and once again, like those, like, those very fundamental understanding like uh, I have about Sakaike kind of pops up again. So how Sakaike narratives are very male-centric. Could it also be that, like, how, I don't know, how a lot of the, like, save your city kind of narrative are very male-centric? Are you speaking from a very male, like, masculine position of us, like, protecting someone, saving someone who is very innocent, um, who is in need? And how women, even in this turbulent time when social order starts to break down, still exist in very stereotypical ways? Like even though we have very strong uh, like female characters in a lot of like Sakaike works, and but like like I really want to show you like the photo of Gunbuster because like the final episode is really really touching, like and I don't know it's very much like um, Sakaike in the same light and the voice of a distant star, but then she can't stop being a woman. I do not know how how like wearing a swimsuit like facilitates your fighting, but obviously they find it very tactical. So you can't stop being a woman even though you are in deep space, like fighting inside a robot, like to save the world. Like, like I think Gunbuster is one of the largest robot in, ro in like robot ACG history. Um, but yeah, anyway, it doesn't matter. So yeah, so what is the role called, like what is the subject that is called a schoolgirl? Or what is the subject that is called a young girl? Like, so throughout like history, at least like recent history, like in Rep Republican era in China and post-war Japan, basically young girls, if not like specifically school girls have been, um, basically have been mobilized and objectified as being very important element or the idealized figure that represent like social change. And so they're young, they're hopeful, they're without burden, they're modernized, and so on and so forth. And are we projecting? Um, so you, while they are featured very prominently in propaganda, like um, in the Republican era and in post-war Japan, does it mean that they like suddenly are, I don't know, given like, they are, are are they suddenly equal? Are they suddenly empowered? Or are they just mobilized or fetishized once again as a symbol of something for the purpose of, I don't know, um, social or national re-engineering? So a lot of the times we can see, even though there are a lot of like very strong female character fighting like on behalf of the world, they still do not have such a like direct relationship with the world as, I don't know, Deng Zanzi, right? Um, I, I, I just really hate him. Um, anyway, so yeah, going back to the umbrella movement. So I was saying that um, when we talk about like the umbrella or social movement in a certain way, young girls are always featured. But when you talk, when you look at how, like, or in which context they were featured, um, there are always like um, 
mobilize as symbols of um, symbols of I don't know representation or symbols standing in the place of like your society needs saving um, that we need you to protect Hong Kong so you act now and like save your home and whatnot or protect the kind of innocence but another like on the other side the other kind of coverage young men are features most prominently and the way they are the way they are presented are as like subjects innocent passively awaiting your saving so for yeah so in movement in a lot of social movement and uh, at least recently so um these four boys um Sun Hock Sam Zi or Sei Zi or So we put together like side by side, like like the friends, their allies in uh, movements, um, Zhao Teng and Nathan Law. So how, of course, like it doesn't mean that when you're in movement. So we went into that dilemma of, do you, how, how should we present ourselves in movement? How should we exist in movement? And this is a very important question for women, because so I was there uh, during the umbrella movement and like, so any one of you have been in any kind of protest? Did you have to ever think about what you wear? I did. Like, at least like in Hong Kong, like during the umbrella movement, I have to think about what I wear. Um, of course, like some of it is because of very practical reasons, like how am I going to use a washroom that are like probably makeshift, makeshift washroom, um, if I can climb over the barrier very easily. But the but a lot of things, a lot of times, society tells us that even in like times where like quote unquote social order seems to be suspended, you do not exist in a as a gender neutral being. You exist as a girl, because when um, because of course it is a space um, that is the let's just say like a temporary utopia, but then like is also a public space. It belongs to the public sphere, and in public sphere or like for women to take part in the civil sphere, anyway, but to take part in the public sphere, you are always and can only, and will always only be a gendered being. So how Nathan Law can present his youthfulness without being criticized? While well, let's just say for uh, Zhao Teng in some of her like um, um, elector, uh, election campaign, she would have to dress like she is more mature because being young and male is an uh, advantage, while being young and female means that you are inexperienced, emotional, unreasonable, and so on and so forth. It is not like an advantage, definitely. Because probably for Yao Wai Zheng, a lot of people will think that she's brainless. If, like, if Nathan Law is idealistic. And so there are, there are like even mobile games for you to like pat her head or like to poke her in the body, which I find immensely inappropriate. Um, and even for like people, like some other like activists, um, such as Willis Ho, um, she is almost only um, featured or represented in erotic light, if not um, like really decoratory light. And um, she was, she later on, uh, she dates this person. She dates this person. But then how the media describe is how she is a woman of very loose moral and that she is corrupting the holy figure of like a young idolist. idealist. 
Um, and it's just very hostile. And whenever you are a girl who takes a very active part in social movement, um, basically the only thing that they will call you would be like a like social movement goddess, like Sai Wan Loi San. And it is like the only light you can exist in. And so people kind of uh, pay attention to whether or not she is wearing makeup, um, what kind of clothes she wears, if she is wearing shorts, and yeah. So comparing, no one, no one comments on the expression on her face apart from like she kind of like she kind of want to cry and she's very emotional and like she is kind of like regretting what she did instead of praising. Like I think she looks equally strong as her boyfriend uh, when they were arrested. But then, but then you will only be represented or understood in a certain light. And especially, of course, like the most scandalous or the most horrible case of like um, bullying or like slut shaming would be uh, towards um, Chen, Chen Chiao An, is it? Is it Chen Chiao An? From like from Taiwan in the sunflower movement. I do not know for sure, sure if she did any of the things that people said she did. And it would be okay for me that she have done everything that um, she that people said that she did. But the only thing that people focus on would be like her looks, how she dressed. If she is a woman of like, um, she if she is a respectable woman with very strict morale. So what are we asking? Like so, what are we looking at? We are looking at how women cannot exist as anything other than a woman, even in times where like social order, other kinds of social order is suspended. That a woman would be persecuted for attacking the police by her breast during a protest. And that a woman would be a woman's body would be targeted um, during movement in order to discourage their participation. And so, yeah, um, so I, I was actually pretty hesitant to show my photo, like, so I was like somewhere there and I have to think about what I wear um, because like later on after, especially after this, I would have to make sure that I'm not dressed in a way that is like too, I won't say too revealing, but um, I don't know, I kind of have that idea even if I am a part of the movement, I kind of have to think an extra layer about how I carry myself in order, I don't know, first thing to protect myself. And the other thing of not to, I don't know, shed a very bad light on the movement. So am I going to wear lipsticks? Am I going to wear a tank top? Am I going to wear shorts? And the most horrible thing is, why do I have to think about all that? And it kind of brings me back to the point, um, like so when we talk about Sekaike or when we talk about the context from which Sekaike emerges, or we talk about like the world that is represented in Sekaike, then a lot of the times we kind of think about it in a way that, oh, now that like social order is suspended, we can start anew, we connect with the world in a very private way. And I think this is one of the, um, the lessons that I've learned. Um, I study philosophy and the lesson, I didn't, I don't think they actually give me anything very concrete other than the experience. Um, because like the department that I studied philosophy in was completely male dominated um, in terms of staff, student population, as well as a content, like the things that they teach. And, and why it frustrated me so much that I decided not to pursue my study in philosophy was because they think about existence in such a simple way. That as if like being, like they think about it as like a mean being. So men represents like the whole of humankind when women can only be themselves. And I don't know, as long as like in the near future, I can't see any way how I can exist as anything other than a woman. So I don't exist like neutrally or I don't exist innocently in this world. I'm always and will only be a gendered being. And yeah, so that is basically what I want to say today. Yeah, thanks. Cool, I guess I'm not, uh, I, I'm quite on time. Okay, okay. thank you so, so much. So we'll have a 10 minute break. Yes, right? we'll have a, a short break, a coffee break, then we come back with uh, Kiko and Christopher Howard. Thank you.